This will be our 45th lesson in Genesis. Time seems like it's went by rather rapidly. They're going to be in the 27th chapter. And we'll conclude this chapter, I believe, tonight. Very controversial part of the book of Genesis. I'm, I'm taking my time going through this because I want to develop a perspective. I want you to see what's, what's happening here. It's kind of a study in theology, <laughs> the knowledge of God. And my own understanding is being shaped by this, so I, I can't go any further than I've seen, of course. I'm going to be in, begin in verse 30 through 46. <coughs> Jacob has just been blessed, you remember, by Isaac. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from hunting, from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat, and brought it unto his father, and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am my son, thy firstborn, Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. And yet, yea, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with sub subtlety and had taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he, and he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him, and what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be with the be <coughs> thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and thou shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because, because of the blessing. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing, wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. These words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and rise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget what thou hast done unto him. 
then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why would I be deprived also of you both in one day? And Rebekah said unto Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? <coughs> Amen. One thing you have to say about the patriarchs, they took things seriously. There wasn't a lot of jesting, was there? Quite a serious text. Now, I've made the affirmation, I, I intend to further develop it and prove it, that we are seeing God fulfill his will. That's what we're seeing. That's right. If you fail to see this in this text, you'll talk like these, excuse the word, numbskulls, that preach to people and find fault with Jacob, and they don't, they just they just don't need to be preaching or teaching. Amen. Amen. This book is not about Jacob; it's about God. Amen. They reduce these things to nothing but family issues. That's right. Earthly family issues. That's as deep as they can go. See, that family matters are as deep, really, as they can go. So that's why they talk about it so much, because that's all they know. <laughs> And quite frankly, I'm not even interested in what they have to say. Because yeah. I don't consider them experts in that field either. <coughs> I want to develop this, that this is God fulfilling his will. <coughs> it's good to briefly review what's happened thus far. And I'm going to do this with two things in mind. One, the initiation or announcement of God's purpose that he made. Second, the fulfillment of divine purpose. I'm going to take the position that only God can do what he has promised. That's what I'm going to develop here. So we're going to look at several high points and what stood between the promise and the fulfillment. I'm going to show you what stood between the promise and the fulfillment. <coughs> take, first of all, the calling of Abraham. <coughs> Here's the call, the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. All right, that's, that's mm -hmm. to get from ur to Canaan. Now ponder the incidents that happened in between. I'm going to show you that God's working through this. First off, his father dies. Yeah. Then there was a temporary stay in Haran until he collected some more servants and goods. Then when he arrived in Canaan, the Canaanite was in the land. And as if that was not enough, there's a famine in the land. This is stuff that lay in between Abraham leaving her and getting to, to, to Canaan. Then because of the famine, he goes down into Egypt Pharaoh takes Sarai into his house. The Lord plagues Pharaoh's house because of this. Sarah's returned to Abraham, and they go back, and they finally are located in the promised land. Now, all that, here, mm -hmm. all that was in between what God said to do and getting there. Yeah. That wasn't as complicated as it was going to get, but I, God was in each one of those things. Yeah. The calling of God was carried out. It wasn't carried out by Abraham. It was carried out by God. And surviving Satan's attempts to thwart it was because of God, not because of some shrewdness by Abraham. Abraham. All right, that's, that's Abraham's call. Now let's, let's consider the promised land. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded and there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now, let's track what lay in between him actually permanently being established in the land. In addition to what we just considered. Abram and Lot had to separate because there wasn't enough land to sustain their flocks. Well, that may sound easy on the surface, but that was not an easy thing to negotiate. 
Then Abram hears that <coughs> Lot's been captured by militant initiative by four kings. And the news comes to him that Lot's captured. And remember, this the land's been promised him. He's got this report. To him. He takes 318 of his trained servants. He, pers he chases these four kings who had ravished the entire area, the region there. And with these 318 men, he divided them up and he overcome these four kings and all their armies and got Lot back and all the goods. But during that, when he got back, he, he meets Melchizedek, who was a high priest of God and a king as well. <coughs> and Melchizedek tells him that God gave his enemies into his hand. Then God tells Abraham that Right after this, God tells Abraham that he's the one that brought him out of Ur and brought him to Canaan. And then God confirmed his covenant to Abraham, providing details about the land as well as what was going to be experienced by his progeny. This is what was in between the land. <laughs> and it's a number of years now. This is a number of years. So the occupation of the promised land was carried out, but there's a lot of things in between, but there were things through which God worked. Now let's, let's consider the promised seed of Abraham, who was Isaac. How did that all work out? <clears throat> God said, I will make thee of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. You're, you're going to have some seed. How did that work out? Well, God promises he's going to give him some progeny or offspring as in Genesis 12 7 the Lord reaffirms a bit later in the 13th chapter that he will give him the land to Abraham and affirms he'll have a multitudinous seed he kind of elaborates on it then some time passes and God appears to Abraham Abram, telling him he is his shield and exceeding great reward and informing him that the patriarch would himself beget the child of the what was the heir. He then uh, some time passed. He then affirms that Abraham's seed would be as numerous as the stars of the heaven, and Abram believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Because she was barren, and nothing more had been revealed about her barren children, Sarah offers to give Abram her handmaid, and that, that the handmaid would bear children to her. And so she gave Abram Hagar a wife. As it worked out, fearing Sarah, because Hagar got kind of arrogant, Hagar flees the house prior to the birth of Ishmael. Angel of God, this all happened in, in between. And an angel meets Hagar there, tells her she's with child and what to name the child and outline to her what kind of man he is going to be and where he dwell. Now when Abraham is 80 years old, Ishmael is born. God appears to Abraham, changing his name to Abraham and telling him he's going to have a lot of offspring. <laughs> and then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, which he carried out circumcising all the male members of his household, Ishmael and himself. Then for the first time, he tells him that Sarah's going to have the child, the promised child. He promises to bless Ishmael, but the covenant he makes clear would be with Isaac. Abraham implements the covenant of circumcision. <coughs> Then some time passes and God appears to Abram again, Abraham again in the form of three men and tells him that about this time the next year he would visit Sarah and Sarah would have a child. <clears throat> and then he divulged that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah where Lot was. And Abram asked God if he'd destroy the righteous with the unrighteous and he reasoned with them in quite a lengthy period of, uh, of interplay. Abram then he encounters Abimelech, 
who tries to take Sarah into his house. You remember when God appeared to Abimelech in a dream said, you're a dead man. Then in the 21st chapter, Isaac is born. Ravishly <laughs> is weaned. Ishmael and Hagar are cast out of the house. All right, of that, <laughs> that's what was involved in having Isaac. You don't want to miss this, see? Now let's take the selection of Isaac's seed, who is Jacob. The Lord said unto Rebekah, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elders shall serve the younger. Now let's consider what led up to this, all of this. <coughs> First, an appropriate wife had to be chosen for Isaac. Remember, he sent the servant out to find an appropriate wife. Delivered instructions on how to find her. The servant takes a caravan of ten camels. He arrives at a well and he asks God to give him a sign when the right woman that he had chosen come along. <clears throat> Before he finished praying, here turns Rebecca up and she asks what he asked God to, the sign he asked God to give him, she, she asked that. She assures him there's room enough in their house for the food for the camels and him and the servants. Rebecca's brother and father finally agree that if Rebecca consents, they'll let her go back to be Isaac's wife. <coughs> and she does when she's, she's found to be barren when she gets back. So Jacob entreats God for her. Her womb is open. She bears, she conceives. And in, an uninterpretable experience happened that she didn't know what was happening. Some abnormality in, in her womb. So she asked God, and he said, that's when he said, two nations are in your in your womb. When they were finally born, the scripture tells us that Rebekah loved Jacob, but Isaac loved Esau. Then we had this incident where Esau was hungry, and he was very willing to sell his birthright, to give his birthright in exchange for a bowl of lentil stew. And he does. Now, believing that Isaac was close to his death, which he, he really wasn't, he lived about 40 years longer, he really wasn't, Isaac decides to have Esau bring in some savory meat like he got it from hunting, and then after he ate, when he's in a good frame of mind and everything, he'd bless Esau. Rebecca overhears, she hears what he said developed this scheme where Esau's clothes were put on Jacob. He was to get two kids of the goats, and she, she fixed a meal that would taste just like the venison that Isaac liked. She put some goat's hair, which is long and silky, on his back of his hands and his neck. And Jacob, acting in accord with what she said, deceived his father, and, and he, he blessed him. Now, I'm saying that this was God fulfilling his purpose. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this, too. <laughs> because nowhere in Scripture does God ever say he's going to do something and leave it up to men to do it. <laughs> so if men did something, God had to move them to do it, or it wouldn't have been done. It isn't that the man does something and God manipulates it and makes it work. That isn't how God works. Now, here's some things God has said to bring me to this unavoidable conclusion. Remember, my point I'm making is God was in all of this. That's why there are no editorial comments by the Holy Spirit. That's why Rebecca wasn't rebuked or, or criticized, or neither was Jacob. See, it's just why. Only Esau, he was criticized. Here's some sayings of God that establish what God purposes, God fulfills. This is a fundamental point of Scripture. I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Right? That's, that's God talking. 
God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? See, this is the point. Get in Job 23, 13. But he is of one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. There it is again. Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. Isaiah 14, 27. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? His hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? See, what he purposed, he does. Amen. What God determines, he does. Amen. That's the point. Amen. Isaiah 38, 15, what shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. I, uh, Jeremiah 50, 45, hear the counsel of the Lord that he has spoken against Babylon and his purposes that he hath purposed against the kind of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate with them. God did it. Here's another in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things according to the, after the counsel of his own will. So there's, there's the proclamation on Scripture that what God purposes, God does. It's God that made this determination about Jacob, and it's God that worked it out. Ephesians, it also says that God is able to do far above all that we can ask or think. So the reason that God has to do what he purposes is because we are incapable of doing yeah. what God wills. Well, and even in, in, in and of ourselves, in the, even if we were capable, this would rob him of his glory. Right. Uh -huh. See, God works to get glory. Amen. That's right. So he has to be in the, he has to be in all of these events that we're that we're talking about. <laughs> well, we're living in a land where even the best of purposes can be broken off just in a matter oh, yeah. of a few days. You can have good desire and good intent. But we do not have the power to control circumstances. That's right. God does. As God does. <coughs> God does not establish a purpose, then bring it to pass by assembling bits and pieces of what people have done. And if you don't believe that this is God working, this is the only other conclusion you can come to. Is that God took what Rebecca did, God took what Jacob did, and kind of made it all work together. What I'm saying is, God doesn't do things like that. Amen. That's why you don't have, there's not a detailed teaching on this subject. There's just enough that you should come to this conclusion. It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. <coughs> God does this by choosing the foolish things of the world. You know, like a mother saying, put some hair on your back or your hands and on the back of your neck and get two kids of the goats and I'll fix it to taste like hunt a like hunted game. See, that's foolish to the eyes of the world, but this is what God used. Note carefully, God does not choose to use the foolish and weak things men do. That's what the text, not what the text says. He hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. He what he does is viewed as foolish. He doesn't take what is foolish that men do and then make it turn out. What he does looks foolish. Just I, this, is, this whole episode here has caused a lot of theologians to stumble and, like a drunk man. They walk through the scripture like a drunk man. They can't keep their bearings. They can't imagine this. So they criticize Abraham. They criticize Jacob. And they criticize Rebekah. And they don't see that this is God. See, it's foolish to them because they don't know God. You can see that, can't you? <laughs> On matters that have confused those who don't know the Lord or have the mind of Christ, the question before us is not whether what Rebecca and Jacob did was right or wrong. The question is, did it fulfill God's purpose or not? If it did, mm -hmm. God did it. Yeah, that's right. You know what? There's no other answer to that question. 
So why do we speak about these things so extensively? Why do I keep going over this? <coughs> because of the pervasive ignorance that exists in the church. We have a professed church on our hands that does, is not acquainted with God. Now, that's the bottom line. They, and the, the seriousness of this is that God has said in the new covenant, they'll all know me. And we got a situation where hardly anybody knows him. Yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah. Now, God's not going to bend his covenant to accommodate these kind of people. Right. We're not trying to condemn people. We're just saying, well, you better know God or you're not in. And the other alternative is God, God lied, or he's leaving it up to men to make the thing all work out. <coughs> and we don't, uh, we don't accept that at all. <coughs> Any doctrine of God or view of things that's contained in Scripture that requires us to contradict any syllable of Scripture can't possibly be right. Yeah, Talking about something said about God. When we're admonished, test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Yeah. All right? We've got people that have tested Rebecca, mm -hmm. yeah. and they've tested Jacob, and they've concluded they were liars. Yeah, that's right. And they were deceitful. Mm -hmm. Even They're ignorant enough to tell us what their conclusion is. Yeah. Uh -huh. People whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, mm -hmm. and are in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11 chapter. Mm -hmm. So they've, pa they've passed their judgment. They, but see, they don't know God. So they can't come up with the right conclusion. The first, uh, we do have some things that are set in stone that we can test people by. One is the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's the sole person to whom you're saved. That person is not of God. It make a difference how sincere they are, yeah. how long they've been to church, what office they hold. If they don't believe Jesus is the only one, he's the one on whom the hopes of the world hang, they're just out, period. Yeah. That's it. First John 2.23 says, Whoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father. He thought if they concoct something, they say, Well, he's really not a son. That's just a comedy in language. But he is the Son. Whoever does not do righteousness, here's, for, here's one of the tests John gives. Yeah. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of God. Amen. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So we don't have to, we don't have to guess about this. Someone says, well, they're a Christian, but they just have this trouble of getting drunk all the time. Mm -hmm. This is a bunch of malarkey. People... Don't listen to people like this. Amen. I love God with all my heart, but I have this little unrighteous thing that I get caught up in all the time. You do it. Do it. He that doeth not righteousness is not of God, period. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. So a person does not believe Jesus was a real man, not of God. <laughs> Those are some things that tests that are cast in stone, you, you don't call for a lot of judgment. That's just straightforward. But there are some other things that are rather difficult to <laughs> determine, like if someone preaches another Jesus, oh, that's a little, it's a little more difficult to discern. You have to have a little more grasp of the scripture. Another Jesus or another spirit or another gospel. There are also those who represent assessments of the saints of old teach people to think about in a demeaning way about David. Like Charles Swindoll, modern day airhead. He is. He said, he preached a series of sermons that I heard called David the Murderer and Adulterer. That was his, that was what he, that's what he preached. Now he knew the Bible said he's a man after God's own heart. He knew it said that, but see, he he used his judgment to trump God's judgment. Amen. Yeah. These people are, they're, they're false. See, these aren't real people. Mm -hmm. These are not real people of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. The modern church says they are, they accept them, they buy their books, they make them wealthy, but these people that talk this way, they're not of God. Amen. Amen. They don't have God's mind. <coughs> Try the spirits. 
So when someone gives you assess their assessment of Abraham or Jacob or David, or, and it differs from what God said, just scratch them off the accepted list. Don't listen to them anymore. <clears throat> now the earth is being managed by the Lord. It is true that the, Satan is the god of this world, but he only has power over his subjects. He doesn't have any power over God's children because God supersedes Satan. And he superintends everything that Satan does. <laughs> Satan operates within the circumference of God's will. He can't, he can't get outside that at all. In view of this, it's imperative that good teaching coordinate texts like we are, have here. You've got to put this thing together. If people aren't students of Scripture, someone who is has to put this thing, put this thing together to see that it is God that works all in all. That's what the Scriptures say. And it's imperative that, uh, that people know this. <coughs> all right, now Jacob, he... Look how well time this is. Now, if Esau had come in before Jacob, then the, the whole yeah. the whole purpose would have fell to the ground as far as appearance is concerned. Or if he would have come in while Jacob was there, mm -hmm. then we had another situation on our hand. But this is being governed by God, so yeah. Jacob doesn't leave till he gets got the blessing. And as soon as he gets it. <coughs> Here comes Jacob. <coughs> now this was not this was not coincidence. We can you can all see this. This was not coincidence. God, God just frankly wouldn't let him come in. Kept him out, and he arranged things so Jacob could get in, get the blessing. <coughs> if it wasn't this way, God could never have said, "Jacob, have I loved." Yeah. See, that's what drove this whole thing. Jacob, have I loved? And Paul said as he was the elected one. Yeah, <laughs> God said he was elected. That's why God drove it, drove it this way. So I gather this is how God worked out his purpose. Now, a new covenant proclamation about God is this, and it's, very, it's a very telling proclamation. There is one God and Father who is above all and through and through all and in you all. <laughs> I give a little academic exposition of the through it all. It means it's found in every, the whoop and wharf, as we would say, the whole thing. God's, God's in it from beginning to end. What God has started, he finishes, and he's in, in between. He's, he's managing the whole thing. The doctrine of Scripture is that particularly in matters relating to his purpose, God himself is found in everything. Amen. Yeah, amen. Whether it's Jacob and skins on his hand, <laughs> or whatever it is, or it's Hagar, God's in all of this, working out his will. See, because there's, there's nations of people that are going to rise out of this whole series of events that are going to line themselves against Israel, and eventually God's going to open their eyes. The whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. All that's in this also. <coughs> now let's see an example how God actually did this. We have the familiar incident of, of Joseph. Hard experience that he had. Brothers sold him. Well, first they threw him in a pit. And they, they took him out. They were going to kill him. Then they, one of the brothers talked him out of doing that. And so they hauled him out and sold him. Years later now... These same brothers show up in Egypt because they needed corn there, standing before Joseph, and they they find out this is this is Joseph. This is our brother who we threw in a pit. Some at least at least thirteen years ago, maybe probably more, maybe as high as twenty. <laughs> Here's what Joseph said: As for you. Ye thought it evil, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day. Most people alive. Right. Now some centuries pass, 
And the psalmist, God speaks to a psalmist, and he addresses the same, the same situation from even a higher viewpoint. Here's what he said. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the stole staff of bread. He sent. He, that wasn't just his brothers took, took him out of a pit and sold him. That was God sending him. Amen. That's how God sent him. That's right. God sent him by Joseph telling his dreams. And some preachers say he was naive. He never should have done that. Yeah. Telling his dreams. His brother gets getting jealous. Throwing him in a pit. Selling him. Concocting a lie that he was killed. But that's how yeah. God sent him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. I, I, I love to think about these yeah. things. See, because you've you got to translate it into your own life. Yeah. A lot of things you think uh -huh. are unworkable. You've got to think this about this. Yes, brother. Tony. I mean, uh, not identical, but it's the same kind of thing <laughs> right. that happens throughout the scripture. That's really, right. When you, when you do like we've done just then, just really just mm -hmm. take it apart and look at it. Israel and Egypt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Same thing. When men try to start uh, reasoning on these things, yeah. that, you, you just have to hush up and just accept the conclusions that scripture's made. That's right. Mm -hmm. this is, to me, this is, this is wonderful. Sometimes when explaining the divine rationale behind things, like Paul one time, he explained the rationale behind Israel, some of the branches being broke off. God turns attention to the Gentiles. And then through the Gentiles making the Jews jealous, and he turns back and grafts in the Gentiles. And he, he spells it all out in Romans 9 through 11, and it's a kind of a complicated thing. But when he gets through... Here's what he says. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, <coughs> who hath been his counselor, who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Now I want to read this to you from the Amplified Bible. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unfathomable, inscrutable, unsearchable are his judgments, his decisions. And how untraceable, mysterious, undiscoverable are his ways, his methods, and his paths. For who has known the mind of the Lord, and who has understood his thoughts, or who has ever been his counselor, or who has first given anything, God, anything that he might be paid back, or that he could claim a recompense? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. For all things originate with him and come from him. All things live through him. All things center in and tend to consummate and end, to end in him. <laughs> to him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. That, that's, uh, that's after you've seen it. <laughs> and you believe it. That, then you say this because it's just, it's just too wonderful. Now apply that to the well, this record we've been reading about. That's your, this is what God's doing in this record. Now, an overly simplistic theology will not allow a person to accept this kind of reasoning. A simpleton would refuse to think like this. <coughs> They'll find it easy to find fault with God, although they won't really say they're finding fault with God, but they are. <coughs> the execution of Divine purpose is not primarily accomplished by the overthrow of human purpose. See? It's by him doing something. <coughs> Raising up an error, an heir from an impotent man and a barren, barren woman, see, that's who would, who would counsel him to do that? Getting Joseph into Egypt so he could save a life of people. Who would have counseled God to do it the way he did it? Or having the birthright of Isaac being assigned to a second-born son, who would, who would counsel God to do? Why wouldn't he just have made Jacob be born first? Amen. Or arranging the grafting for the grafting again of the Jewish people, even though some people say they're cut off forever. Mm -hmm. See, no one has given counsel to God. It's God that tells us. This purpose was mine, and I'm the one that worked it out. You may not like the way I worked it out, but I'm the one that worked it out, and it's to your advantage to like it and to receive it. <laughs> 
Well, Isaac tells his, Isaac says to his father, who art thou? Well, that's the same thing he asked Jacob. Remember when Jacob came, he said, who art thou? Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm thy son, thy firstborn Esau. That's almost the same thing, Jacob. And Jacob said, I'm Esau, thy firstborn. It's almost the same scenario. Something happened in Isaac. When this happened, I'm beginning to see that things are beginning to fall together now in Isaac's mind, and he trembles exceedingly. Some versions say violently, shook uncontrollably. <coughs> Here's one what someone has said about this verse. A man named Lang, literally, he feared a great fear to a great degree, shuddered in great terror above measure. Augustine, we're talking about a man who lived in 400 A.D. Mm -hmm. Augustine said he wanted with an exceeding great admiration mm -hmm. emphasize the patriarch's astonishment, the first even suggesting the idea of a trance or supernatural elevation of the prophetic consciousness. So, mm -hmm. in other words, he's he, he come into like another mm -hmm. another level of divine consciousness. Things are kind of falling to, falling together for him. See, he's a person of faith. That's what he's noted for. He says he's noted for faith. He was a man God is not ashamed to associate with him. I'm the God of Isaac. See, he's not ashamed. So did, did Isaac tremble because he thought Esau should have had the blessing, but he made a mistake? No. I, I think he'd, if that was the case, he'd have tried to rectify it by switching the blessing around. Or was it that it suddenly dawned on him that he'd, mm -hmm. he'd chosen the wrong person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I think happened. Yeah. Yeah. I picked out the wrong person. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, the scriptures don't tell us that Rebecca ever told him about this, what God told her. Whether she did or not, I don't know. But the scriptures don't say that, that she did. So it seems to me that it suddenly dawned on him that the blessing really did not belong to Esau at all. But he thought it did. Shuddered with a great terror. But see, God protected the circumstance. So there was not any unnecessary confusion. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, you can kind of liken that to um, the point where you realize that maybe what you had believed was not right. what it should have That's been. Right. The kind of fear That's that right. you had at that mm -hmm. time. It is so, a fear, yeah. You know, of... I thought this, but this is what yeah. it should have been. That's you know? right. See, people of faith, the, the thought that they have proceeded wrongfully is a is a shaking type thing. It's a fearful thing yeah. to think I was wrong. Yeah. In, view, in view of God's will, I would think I was wrong. Yeah. Now, we have a, a new generation of Believers, I'm not sure that they are believers, but we have a new generation of believers in our day that are totally lacking in the fear of God. They actually think God doesn't care what they look like. Even though the very first issue God had with man was what he looked like and what the clothes he wore. That was the first. <laughs> it's the first issue God had with men was their clothes. Do they think that the fact that styles have changed, do they, do they think God's changed? They, they were immodest clothes. See, they were what we call loincloths. They were immodest. Do, you, do they think God suddenly has changed and so now he doesn't think anything about it? Well, they don't know God very well. The fear of God is addressed repeatedly in Scripture. This new breed of disciple that doesn't fear God <coughs> They love simplicity. What the simpler it is, the more they like it. They lack wholeheartedness. They get too much up and down. They're in and out, inconsistent. They're too close to the world. And they're satisfied. There's just a little bit of scriptural knowledge. They're satisfied with it. This, this, uh, this kind of disciple is multiplying. This is multiplying and growing, growing, growing. It's characterized, this generation is characterized by presumption and has inner, erroneous views of God and has allowed the world to shape their thoughts. 
Now I'm going to go on record. I'm offended by this generation. Amen. Yeah. I am. Amen. Try and be as patient, as kind as we can. We're not to be unkind, impatient, but I don't like this generation. Mm -hmm. yeah. They offend me. Mm -hmm. They've got to be talked to straightforward. Mm -hmm. No pussyfooting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody else does. Right. The church is the only people that dumb things down. Everybody else lets it be known what they expect. So yes, I'm offended by this generation. There is a sense, I understand, in which we do not fear. We serve God without fear. God's not giving us a spirit of fear, I understand. But that's a fear that draws back. We don't have that kind of fear. And I... Isaac says, I blessed him, and he shall be blessed. I mean, that, he shall be blessed. At this point, he's not sure, apparently, who he's blessed, but he don't know whoever it was. He got the blessing. Now he knows it wasn't Esau. He does know that it wasn't Esau. I have an idea that Isaac, who was grieved by who he married and all this, the kind of things begin to kind of fit together for Isaac at this point. Well, Esau hears this, and he, he cries out with a great and exceeding bitter cry. Now, you have to be in the Eastern world to hear this kind of thing. We, we live in a silent country where people don't know how to talk or shout or unless they're at a rock concert or something. They, they don't use their voices. But see, this isn't the way the rest of the world is. Loud, bitter cries. It blessed me, even me, oh, my father, oh, just... He didn't think anything about selling his birthright, didn't think a thing in the world about it, but now all of a sudden, yeah. uh, blessing is very important. Mm -hmm. He didn't think of asking his father who he ought to marry. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. He didn't ask for a blessing there, did he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, however, he has a keen interest in what his father says yeah. now, all of a sudden. Now that he himself is... The estimated ages, he was, the ex generally accepted ages, that Jacob and Esau were 77 at this time, and Isaac was 137. So that's a long time to be ignorant in your way of God. But he was <coughs> exceeding bitter cry. Now when Esau was made aware that you know, why his wives were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebecca, he didn't, he didn't cry it in at all. <clears throat> See, it, scriptures tell us about Esau that he was a profane, yeah. Hebrews 12, 17, he was a profane or godless mm -hmm. person or irreligious. Amplified Bible says godless and sacrilegious. So he was not, a, he was not even like a religious man. Cain did offer some sacrifice, but there's no evidence that, that Esau did. See, so he's a profane man. The scripture spells that out for us. Oh, my father, bless me too. Some verses say, bless me too. You just give a blessing to me. Don't let me leave. I've been planning on this. I went out and hunted and got this special venison for you. Now, we don't have to, like, stab in the dark about this text. There's a, the Holy Spirit brings this very incident up in Hebrews 11, 15 through 17. Looking, I, he, he says, don't, don't be like Esau now. Now, you're, you're a believer. Don't, don't be like Esau. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have, when he would have, or when he should have, we would say, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Me? Yeah. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So there, there's a common. There's an inspired commentary of this. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't just that Isaac rejected him. Uh -huh. Isaac did reject him, but yeah. he was rejected by God. Before he was born, he was rejected. 
Now things to note here, there are some things that are especially worthy of note here. One is the character of Esau. I'll never forget when uh, Brother Aaron and I visited, uh, I've always forget the name of that town. Your dad preached there, I think. Mount Olive. Mount Olive, yeah. And we went to attend, it was some of Aaron's first exposure to things people believe after his eyes had been opened up. And they were, this was the text they were, <laughs> this was the text they were dealing with. So one lady spoke up, said, I don't know how parents could treat their child like they treated Esau. It, it kicked off a kind of a discussion about this, how unreasonable, how what kind of parents were they anyway? Why did Rebecca act that way? Oh, it was, it was terrible. So then someone spoke up and said, well, we're just like those Israelites. Your, your father said, said, yeah, he said. So then I spoke up and I said, well, I'm not like the Israelites. And your dad said, yeah, we aren't like the Israelites, are we? I said, yeah, that's right, brother. Yeah. But that was their assessment of this. <laughs> this case, it was, a, it was a mama session where they evaluated mothers. Terrible. <laughs> they forget the character of Esau. See, the Bible tells you what his character was. He was a wicked man. He disregarded his birthright. He despised it. That's the kind of man he was now. Would you give an inheritance to this kind of man? Well, neither does God. He was, at the, he was rejected at the time. He would have ordinarily been accepted. He was rejected. <laughs> the Spirit doesn't say he was cheated. It says he was rejected. And he found no place for repentance. <laughs> now, this is represented different ways in different versions. Some represent that the repentance was Esau repenting, and some say he found no place for Isaac to repent. Well, actually, I don't see any measurable difference between the two. He couldn't. He couldn't change. He couldn't change the course of events. And repentance normally can. Repentance can change the the situation. Who art thou, Lord? You know. It changed, changed the situation. But here, he couldn't repent. Because right. of the kind of person he was. Plus, because of God's predetermination. He couldn't. He couldn't repent. Now, Hebrews takes this, make sure you're not like, make sure yeah. you don't get in the situation where you're like Esau was. Where you, yeah. you're backed into a corner and you can't get out of it. Amen. Make sure. I do think that needs to be said. <coughs> That's why I'm going to say he didn't repent because he couldn't do so. He'd cross that line beyond which God would not give repentance. See, God gives repentance. This is taught in 2 Timothy 2, 26. A person who opposes himself just as a Virtually a reprobate, you try you don't, don't quarrel with him. Try and bring him around. Deal gently with him. It may be God will give him repentance. The text says, "Maybe, maybe God will give him repentance." So he'll acknowledge the truth and then be delivered from the snare of the wicked one. But this couldn't happen here because we're talking about a purpose here. God is God hasn't unveiled His purpose for every person to us. I don't question that he does have a purpose for people, but he hasn't divulged it, but he did. He has divulged what his purpose for Esau and Jacob was. <laughs> then he goes on, he elaborates. He gives his assessment, and it's interesting, those that criticize Jacob t take the same assessment Esau. <laughs> They're Esauites. He said that... Isaac says, thy brother came with subtlety and had taken away the blessing. Well, actually, the blessing never did belong to Esau. Uh -huh. right. From day one, yeah. never did belong to Esau. But now he knows it's Jacob, thy brother. Uh -huh. See, before he, did, who, before he said, who, 
who was this that came in here? Now it's, he put it together. Now that, that was Jacob. Your brother came in <coughs> at the behest of his mother. And he did employ deceit. Yes. So it's not my intention to justify employing deceit. But this is the methodology that God used to carry out his plan. If you think it out, I don't know how else he could have carried it out without just imposing it. That's it, 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 not always God's manner either. <laughs> so God had announced his purpose before the birth, and he, this is how he carried it out. Now, there are some times that, that God has used deceit to do his will. <laughs> So it's good to, some people don't know these things in the Bible, so that's why I'm going to take a couple of the cases. Let's take David versus David. On one occasion, David had fled from Saul, King Saul, and he went to Achish, the king of Gath, the Philistine. And while he is there, the servants of this king told him, yeah, the women are singing over there, they're saying, Saul had killed his thousands, and David his ten thousand. The ten thousands were Philistines. They were their people. And they're saying, yeah, let's say they're bragging. This, this man that we got over here, he's been wiping out our armies. And the women down in Israel are singing about it. And David knew that they, this word got to him, so David was afraid. I mean, people weren't kind in those days. He was afraid of the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands. You act like a crazy man. And he scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run fall down upon his beard. He just acted like a, like a crazy person. Now, that was deceit. If you want to look at it from a flesh, that was. <laughs> but he's not criticized for doing this. And David escaped and went to his father's house and continued on in his work for the Lord. <coughs> Let's take another case. <coughs> Rahab. After Israel wandered the wilderness for 40 years and all the done believers had died off, all the done believers that didn't, didn't believe the report that they could take the Canaan, Joshua sent out a couple of men and they lodged with Rahab the harlot. They were sent to spy out the land. He was with Rahab the harlot. And the king of Jericho heard about that they were there. And he said to Rahab, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thy house, for they be come to search out the, all the country. So after hiding the spies, Rahab says, The woman took the two men, hid them, and said thus, there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were or where they came from. And, and it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. <laughs> she, she were still in the house. So if you want to be judged according to the flesh, that was, that was deceitful. But this is how God saw it, because he spared her and her whole family just because she did that. That's right. Because she did that, uh -huh. she was spared when they conquered Jericho. And further than that, she was in the lineage of the Lord. Pardon? Mm -hmm. Further than that, she was in the lineage That's of the Lord. That's right. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> now let's take the case of Jael. During the days of Deborah, the judge, Sisera's army, was soundly defeated by her military man, Barak. During the defeat, Sisera jumped out of the chariot and fled and ran into the tent of this woman, Jael. And Jael meets him. She was a, a wife of Eber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said, Turn in, my lord. Turn in to me. Fear not. You'll be safe. When he turned into her in the tent, she covered him with a mantle, also giving him some milk to drink. And after assuring him everything's going to be all right, he falls asleep. And Jael <laughs> took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the, temp smote the nail into his temples and fastened it under the ground, for he was fast asleep, so he died. That's after telling him he's going to be safe. Mm 
Well, he can judge according to the flesh, see? See, well, that's deceitful. Well, she was. She, part, yeah. <laughs> Had a long rest. Oh, I just have one more. Ehud. Ehud was a judge. <coughs> A woman was said, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up, raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah the Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him the children of Israel sent a present to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now before going into the king, it says that Ehud made him a dagger which had two sides, sharp on two sides, of a cubit in length. That would be a, a 10 to 11 inches long. After presenting the present to Ehud, sending the others away uh, to Eglon, Ehud went to the king and said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right hand and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade. The knife disappeared in his, <laughs> in his belly. And fat closed upon the blade, blade so that it could not draw the dagger out of his belly and dirt came out. Mm -hmm. That was de deceitful, wasn't it? I got, I got a word from God. Yeah. Oh, boys. Huh? I think that was a word from God. Yeah. yeah. See, what, what I'm pointing out here is during these primitive times, these were spiritually primitive times. This isn't how God works today as so far as we know. But these were spiritually primitive times when little had been revealed. And these are some of the instances that tell you how God worked. Mm -hmm. So nobody should stumble at this incident with yes. Jacob and Esau. Amen. Now let's just let's nail this down about Jacob, about Jacob and the blessing. <laughs> God announced the supremacy of Jacob before he and Esau were born. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, God loved Jacob. Hated Esau. Paul makes clear that this did not take into account anything they did. Right. Yep. Romans 9 deals, brings this whole incident up. God did it in order that his purpose according to election yeah, right. might stand. Right. In all of this, God did not act unrighteously. Because the next question Paul asks, is there unrighteousness yeah. with God because he did this? No. This is traced back to God. What, what God wanted to do. I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And whom I will, I harden. So he had mercy on Jacob, and he hardened Esau, and he did it because he wanted to, and that should, should be good enough for you right there. And the fulfillment of God's purpose, therefore, is not of him that willeth, or of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. So God's will not, was not altered to agree with what Rebekah and Jacob did. Rather, it was carried out by that means. I spent a little time on that, but I think it's important. And periodically, I'm going to go over this again to establish that this is how God works. And men are not at liberty to judge God for what he does. Amen. <laughs> now Esau responds to this news. That your brother came in and he left with the blessing. He said, is not... He rightly named Jacob. Well, now this this is stuff that's preached about Jacob. They're Esauites. See, these preachers are Esauites. They're me, they're Edomites in disguise. They come up with the same conclusion as Esau come up with. Yeah, right. He's not he rightly named Jacob. Now I I I have a little thing there as well, what the etymology of Jacob is. Supplant. That can mean that you force you force your way in, but the actual meaning the word it took the place of, and Jacob took the place of Esau, just like God said, the elder will serve the younger. Amen. So the emphasis could be on the end result, not that, on the that, not on the manner that the end that's result exactly. is Exactly. That's, that's exactly it. That changes the view completely. And Esau said, he took away, he took away my birthright. He didn't take it away, he bought it. That's right. 
And Esau offered it, sold it willingly. See, but this is what he said. He took it away. He didn't take it away. He made sure that it was clear that this, this was a free, free will thing, so to speak. <laughs> Profane man. That's, That's right. Profane man interprets That's God's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. <clears throat> now he's taken away my blessing. Well, according to the flesh, Esau might argue that Jacob got the blessing by stealth, but it was the will of God that was implemented. And yeah. God doesn't implement his will by twisting man's stealth. <laughs> he works through certain means, like Ehud taken out Eglon. Then uh, again, now he has a sudden interest in blessing. He, he didn't have it. Now for the first 70 years of his life, he didn't have, he didn't have this interest. Now he, all of a sudden he's got it. He said, uh, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? I mean, isn't, there, isn't there something that I could have? Now there's some valuable lessons to be learned from this. One is it's, it's not easy to recover from despising sacred things. Yeah. Now you, prob you probably know some people that, have, that once apparently were attracted to the things of God, but now they despise them. Well, it's going to be very difficult yeah, that's right. to recover from that. That's why the scripture says, despise not prophesying. Why? Because it'll be hard once you have a bad attitude toward things God gives, it's very difficult. Israel can tell you now. It's very difficult to recover from that. Despise not the chasing of the Lord. Don't be murmuring when the Lord clamps down on you and chastens you. Don't be murmuring about that. Whoso despises the word shall be destroyed. So don't, don't let the word of God just become like common. You can put, put it to the side whenever you want. Or he that refuseth instruction despiseth, despiseth his own soul. What I'm saying is that despising, looking down on, not counting valuable, is difficult to recover because you have to do a lot of things to get in that state. He that keepeth the commandments keepeth his own soul. He that despiseth his, God's ways, shall die. Despiseth thou the riches? Of his goodness, he, all of us have, God's been pretty patient with all of us, really. Yeah. And when you think about it, don't despise it. Now, there are words that cannot be recalled. The blessing of Jacob is one such word. It can't be recalled. When Adam and Eve were thrust out of the garden, it, it, that couldn't be reversed. Cain was cursed, that, that couldn't be reversed. The flood couldn't be reversed. Saving of Noah's house, it couldn't be reversed. And, and a number of things like that. So God's ways are unsearchable and past finding out, but it's good to know, to be familiar with his ways, whether you're able to plumb their depths or not. That, that's something else. But just to acknowledge it, it will take a great burden off your soul, brother. Amen. Just to be satisfied, they're past finding out, and accept them without knowing all the details, that will bring rest to your soul. <clears throat> now Isaac replies behold I have made him thy lord boy that, was, that, that must have stung there huh? Yeah. I made him thy lord the blessing was be lord over thy brethren see I made him and all, all thy brethren all thy brethren I've given to him your offspring I've given to him too and all thy brethren have I given to him for service. All this is involved in the elder serving the younger, see. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. So he's going to be prosperous and I'm going to care for him. I've already blessed this. The blessing was, therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven, dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. So that's just he's telling him. I've, I've given him that fruitfulness. But the land whether ye go to possess, see, this is what God promised before Jacob. But the land whither thou goest to is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water from the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. 
All that was given to Jacob and to his seed. Amen. Moses said, He will bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of the land, thy corn, thy wine, thy flocks, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep, in the which which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Now under the old covenant, that was conditioned by their obedience. Okay. Yep. And he said, what shall I what shall I do unto thee? Some words say, what is, what is left? I mean, what is left? I gave all the good stuff to Jacob. What, what, what am I going to give you? What, what, is, what remains? He knows he has no right to alter. He knows that this inheritance has to do with Abraham. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. So he has no right to tamper with this at all. That's right. yep. He knows that. And <laughs> Esau asked him, just, just one blessing. Just, just, just one blessing, my father. Bless me. Even me. Just me. Remember me. Just one. He lifted up his voice and wept. To which, he, which Hebrews 12, 17 says, For you know how that after it, when he would have re inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. But he does, Isaac consents to give him a, a blessing. It's a little one. It's nothing to compare with what Jacob got. It says, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. Let's see. Do you know what a fan I am of these various versions? Let me share with you what they say. Other versions read, behold... Away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. In other words, that here your home will be of the richness of the earth and the dew of heaven. That's the same thing as our text says. Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. In the fat of the earth and in the dew of heaven from above shall thy blessing be. The plate, here's, here's the God's Word Bible. The place where you live will lack the fervent fields of the earth and the dew of the sky above. See, your abode shall enjoy the fat of the earth and the dew from heaven. That's the Jewish Bible. Yours shall be no life of ease and luxury. That's the living Bible. You will not live on good ground. You will not have much rain. That's the English Revised Version. These are Bibles, people. No dew from heaven uh, for you, nor fertile fields for you. It's a good news Bible. Behold, your dwelling shall be from the fat of the earth and from the, dew, from the dew of heaven, the heavens above. That's good. Lo, the fatness of the earth is thy dwelling and of thy dew of, of heaven from above. Your blessing, dwelling, shall all come from the fruitfulness of the earth and from the dew of the heavens. Behold, in a linear Bible reads, from the oils of the earth, he is becoming dwelling of you from night mist of the heavens above. You see, <laughs> you split about, it's split about in two. Some of the versions say where you're going, there isn't going to be good land, and there isn't going to be rain, and the others say there is going to be. <laughs> now, there is an answer to this. Of course, you've got to go to the Bible. It is true that the land eventually was a desolate land. But now that's not how it started out. Here's Malachi gives this record. Malachi 1, 3 and 4. I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste. See? Yeah. It wasn't waste before. I laid it waste. Yeah. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. See, they, they were used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't always that way. They shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call in the border of wickedness. Jeremiah speaks about this. point of bringing out is the land that was given to Esau originally was a good land. Mm -hmm. But because of their conduct toward Israel, God made it desolate. Yeah. Jeremiah said, also Edom shall be, be a desolation. Everyone that goeth by it shall be astonished. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always that way. Ezekiel said, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut it 
cut off man and beast from it, I will make it desolate from Teman. Joel said, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness. So I conclude. <coughs> when it was given to Esau, it was, it was fertile. Malachi points out because they had abused Israel, God made it desolate. So the, the promise that he gave, the blessing, was, was accurate. Yeah, that's right. By thy sword shalt thou live. It was going to be a militant type people. God wasn't going to protect them, in other words. Mm -hmm. And you remember Jesus said, all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So it was, uh, it was a curse to have to live by the sword. You will serve your brother. That was fulfilled during David's reign. The Edomites became David's servants. Now here's an interesting text. Thou shalt, it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. All right, that happened during the reign of Jehoshaphat when the Edomites broke loose from the dominion. The record is found in 2 Chronicles 28, 17. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, 2 Kings 8, 20. In his days at Jehoshaphat, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So they broke... <laughs> it didn't stay that way, but yeah. so the nature of Esau's offspring was set out before him. After hearing all of this, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing. I have some versions, like the contemporary English version which is excellent for starting fires, that Bible is. So Esau hated Jacob because of what he had done to him. That's, well, right. that, that's not proper. The Good News Bible says he, Esau hated his brother Jacob because he stole the blessing that was supposed to be his. But the text says because, because of the blessing. Whether Esau himself realized it or not he was angered by the focus of God upon Jacob instead of himself same trouble Cain had remember Abel and his offering were accepted Cain got upset about it that's the same thing here <coughs> now this experience this parallels the experience of saints throughout the ages <coughs> they've been hated by the world because they're not of the world Jesus said to his disciples, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore, you therefore, because I've chosen you out of the world, you're, because you're not like them, in other words, therefore the world hates you. <coughs> That's why Jacob hated Esau. He said, I'll slay my brother Jacob. My, my father's going to die, right? He thought he's going to die pretty soon. It says that morning of my father are at hand. Well, they weren't at hand at all. He lived 40 more years. So he wasn't at hand at all, but he thought, that's, that's all. I'll kill him when this is all over. <coughs> no wonder the scripture says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why? Because when you live godly, there's because of the stark contrast between those that are of God and those that are not becomes very apparent. <laughs> now here's God governing this whole situation. Remember, God's in this whole situation. <laughs> Esau doesn't get up and announce this to everybody. Mm -hmm. Somebody heard it. Yeah. And the words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. Mm -hmm. God governing this situation. Right. And so she, uh, <coughs> she calls in Jacob, tells him what's happened. Your brother's going to plan to kill you. So now I want you to get away from here and go to the house of my brother Laban. Well, that's where Rebecca lived, which is where Isaac got his wife from the same yeah. same house. <laughs> so she knew for sure. We, you could get a, uh -huh. you'll be safe there. 
So he knew Esau and his progeny would serve Jacob eventually and his offspring. was going to teach, just to get away for the time being, you need to get away. Flee to Laban, my brother. Now, it had apparently been a lot of years since she'd seen Laban. And the, the way the text reads, as you proceed, it says her father, Bethuel, it sounds like he was still alive at, at the time. We know she never returned, and Isaac never did leave Canaan. And she never did go back to her home. It's been a long time since she'd been there. How long? I don't know. It'd been at least, at least 20 or more years. And tarry with him a few days. Well, it turned out to be 20 years. <laughs> he stayed there 20 years <laughs> in just a few days. Rachel was counting on Esau calming down, see. She must have known him. They finally get over it. And when, he, when Jacob finally did confront Esau, he had gotten over it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. This is the last mention of Rebecca in the scripture. The next mention is when she's called a mother of Jacob and Esau. And then in the 49 chapters, it says she was buried in the cave of Machpelah where Abraham and Sarah were buried. So this is the last. She served the purpose God raised her up for. She didn't have any other children so far as we know. And so she served the purpose, see. Get, nurture Jacob up, protect him as much as you can, get him ready for the blessing. Then she said, uh, stay there. Why should I be deprived of you both in one day. What does that mean? In what sense would he lose them both in one day? Well, she must have known what God said, whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. So that if, if Esau did kill Jacob, someone would kill him. Or one person said, well, maybe they'd kill each other, duked it out and kill each other. But she, she knew that vengeance belonged to God and Esau might kill Jacob, so far as she, everything he's concerned, but she knew he wouldn't get by with it. God would, God would kill him. And she didn't want all this to happen in one day. It was just too, too much. So you get away from here for a while. <coughs> <coughs> then she goes in and has a talk with Isaac. She says, uh, Isaac, I'm weary. I'm weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do to me? Said that to Isaac. I'm tired of living. One version says I'm disgusted with living. NIV. My life is a weariness to me. I'm sick of my life. I loathe my life, and I'm deeply depressed. Well, Rebecca, how come you feel so bad? That's these hit tight women. See, there are factors that can make a person weary and want to die. Elijah, he's, he got worried. He said, It's enough. Let me die. It's, it's enough. Job said, My soul is weary. Of my life. I just, oh, you don't think that can happen to you? I mean, it, uh, it probably will happen to you, so you'll know. You could, life becomes a burden. David said, I'm worried with my groaning. Oh, I'm worried with my groaning. I'm worried with my crying again, Psalm 69. And why had, why had life been such a burden for this man of woman of faith? Because of the daughters of Heth. These women that he saw married were a pain in the neck. Already it's been revealed that the wives that he married caused Isaac and Rebecca grief, but it, it was extended and just got... Nobody, I imagine, would like, like to think about this, but sometimes your greatest grief can come from your family members. It's not, we're not talking about like hatred and venom and this kind of thing. We're just talking about grief. Yeah. Dis, distress. Right. There's some people that you just wish they could move away. 
we am. Serious. That's how she felt about these Hittite women. And Esau was so so ignorant, he, he stuck them right under their nose and stayed there. And she was very weary of it. But her mind is clear. And she says, uh, <coughs> If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life be? We, Isaac, we got to make sure Jacob doesn't marry the wrong yeah, women. Yeah, right. Amen. Yeah. She, she, she had grief. But it, it didn't rob her of, her, of th the ability to think, uh -huh. reason soundly. <laughs> you know, living in the proximity of the elect of God had no moral or spiritual impact on these women, Visa. You think, maybe it'd rub off. Maybe they'd, maybe they'd kind of catch on how you ought to live. No, it doesn't work that way. You may think that, too. You may think so. Take a whirly hick into your house and think, "I'll just, I'll just convert him. He'll, he'll learn." Well, he may convert you too. Uh -huh. right. Don't borrow grief. Yeah. When something grieves you, don't let it come in the house. Yeah. If you have a say so about it. Uh -huh. So Rebecca now is paving the way for the myth, for the seed that leads up to Christ. Yes. And. It would be quite a quite a bit about Laban and Jacob, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but can you see how God has been Amen. working? Now he's he's got this thing. It made, we're back to Laban and Bethuel now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this because now with Jacob he's going to be get the twelve tribes. Yeah, okay. So now this this is going to be the the last kind of begetting seed. The 12 tribes are going to be begotten here. So the thought of Job choosing a wife from the Hittites, oh, that was... What good will it be to be free? To be alive if that happens. That's how sensitive this woman was. I know, I know mothers, I don't criticize them, but I know mothers that have learned to live with distressing circumstances. Sometimes they don't have a choice. I mean, I understand that. Sometimes because of illness or something like that, there's, you just don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Rebecca didn't have a choice here, but it was, uh, it made life more burdensome. And believe me, brethren, that just the ordinary burdens of life were enough without adding, unnecessarily adding to them. So if you've got, uh, <laughs> this is hard to say, but if you've got children that are that are of adult age, we're not, talk, we're not talking about children that are in your care. You've got children that are of adult age, and they're bullheaded, and they won't turn. Do the best you can, but you're going to have to learn to let them go. Yeah, that's right. I don't mean I don't mean hopeless let go, but you're going to just have to stand back, stand back, and. Let someone else do the, yeah. do the work. Why? Because it's hard to recover from distress and sorrow. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. Some of you know what I'm talking about already. It, it, uh, so anytime you have a chance to alleviate the sorrow that you have in a, in a legitimate way without being inconsiderate and this sort of thing, by all means, by all means, Send Jacob to Laban. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You have fleshly minded children. Anyway, they're just going to see you as fleshly. That's right. That's like, right. Like Esau saw this whole thing <coughs> through the eyes of flesh. That's right. Uh -huh. And so they're, they're going to, if, if they have that view, that's all they're going to see you anyway. Yeah. And so the, maybe someone else can reach them. That's right. Yeah, Esau, he, he saw it most like playing favorites. Is that yeah. Kind of how he viewed it, evidently. Yeah. Two things. One thing goes with that. Esau really didn't want the blessing that Jacob was going to get. <laughs> That's not the blessing he wanted. No. So he really got part of what he wanted. Anyway. Yeah, he insisted so, on it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
other thing I noticed was that God used Rebecca all through this time. Yeah. Jacob. Yeah. I mean, even after Isaac knew that it was going to be Jacob, you would think, well, why didn't somebody go and tell him of what Esau said about he was going to kill his brother? They didn't. They went and told Rebecca. Yeah. She's the one who, who That's God right. used to work all this out. <laughs> she was the representative. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Sister Barbara. Well, something I was impressed with through the study tonight. Your point in the beginning about God orchestrating, God causing all of these things to fulfill His purpose. But He has vessels by which He brings things to pass. Yes. That's right. We're His vessels. Yes. That's right. And the, the knowledge that we've been chosen and elected of God shows that we are vessels of His mercy. Amen. And vessels of honor that He's going to continue to use. And so it, this knowledge and being able to see this provokes us to be more fit vessels and more Amen. Bring will to pass. Really? Now, it's good to take like the things we've seen here and think of the trip Brother Aaron and Brother Michael took yeah. and the things they confronted. They managed to negotiate negotiate to them, see, but then that was their that was their design. They've this is work a this is worth a postgraduate course. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're learning they're learning the ways of God and you can't you can't learn this academically. They they were both strong and they're able to it wasn't pleasant, but they're able to address the thing and negotiate through it. So I guess I'm anxious to hear the reports and see him again. Amen. Yes. <laughs> so I've seen two circumstances where one brother wanted what the other had, but you got two completely different reactions. Jacob wanted that birthright, but he bought it and he fed his brother, took care of him. It was like an, it was more of an honest, more honorable type of way of possessing it. But when Esau wanted what Jacob had, he resorts to murder and hatred. I yeah. saw in both circumstances the yeah. nature of the person was brought to the surface. Yes, amen. <laughs> yes, Brother Reggie. The truth that God, his ways are past finding out, becoming more clear. Yeah, marvelous. Um, mm -hmm. That God chooses to use wisdom to bring about his purpose rather than always a display of just yeah. overt power. I mean, he could have done that with Joseph. He could have just supplanted the Pharaoh and made him put mm. him on the throne. Mm -hmm. Could have done that. And in this situation, he could have done it like that too. But uh, but see now, when it comes to the, to sin, he couldn't have put away sin by an over just forced display of power. That's right. He required wisdom, and a kind of wisdom that the world would never have seen. Mm -hmm. For God to become flesh and dwell among us, and then to die on a cross of all things, mm -hmm. was something that a man would never have thought yeah. of. Mm -hmm. But see, then that is what brings glory to God. If they, if God had divulged that to the Jews, they would not have crucified Christ. Yeah. God could have just killed Esau. Then Jacob would have been the. Person. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. But he had other things that he was other, going to do right. in this circumstance. See, these Edomites and these offspring of Abraham's other children, mm -hmm. this all figures in this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Amen. Brother Gene said God could have just killed him and been done with it. Or we're watching, seeing how God works. It, it, that's how men do. They always, they always look for the easy way out. But God, he, he's working his, this is for his purpose. And for his glory, yeah. like you were talking about at the beginning, God's going to get the glory out of this. And we can see this in today, how things sometimes, it seems like evil men are just getting away with things. But they're not. God's working That's it all right. out, and he's going to get the glory at the end of this. See, sometimes <coughs> God says, this is what I'm going to do. The ship's going to break up. But you're going to get on this island, and everyone's going to arrive safely on the island. There's other times he doesn't divulge the details, but they are discoverable. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I forgot to mention that Paul's nephew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, that's how he worked out. The nephew overheard it, uh -huh. told Paul. Paul told the captain, yeah. safe man. Then there's other times when he just he doesn't tell you at all. You, you have to trust God that... You're living unto him. Mm -hmm. See, this all presumes now you're living 
you're living for God, you're living for His glory, and you and if you don't understand what's happening, you've got to trust God that He's doing what's what's right, and it will you know, the latter end is going to be good. And the Lord, the Lord had told Paul, as you testified for me in Jerusalem, that's right. You shall also testify that's for me right. in Rome. But it took you know two and a half years. That's right. Before he stood in Rome. Then yeah. he interpreted All those prophecies. Remember, they told him, bonds await thee. And some of the brethren said, well, you better not go. But see, he he was looked at them from, from the inside he had. said, oh, this is just getting me ready for what's going to happen when I get there. Yeah. Remember what Job said? Though he slay me, yeah. yet will I trust, well, I trust him. him. He, didn't have, he didn't have any explanation about no. what was going on. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, life become very worrisome to him and all. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're, we're grateful for the, these great texts in which you have revealed your nature. We find them very edifying and consoling. Pray you continue to show us your ways, and uh, we covenant to give thee praise for it and to order our path according to them. In Jesus' name, amen.